I wanted to ask about the classical or ton practice. What do you think about the, those practices of you know, where you just patiently endure, say, walking hours on the jungkong because one has set the hours and one wants to do these things, and then um, yeah, and, and opposite of that, those those practices that we think are the higher practices where we practice, say, from the inside more, and that, about that relation or ton, you know, and bear with it and and the ones that we think wow this is really coming from the inside can you oh, yeah, the, the culture here is very is like oton type of I mean it's the kind of essence of the Isan cultural attitude but, uh, and I think I'm you know they use the word toraman and oton and and these, like Toramar, it easily gets translated into torture in English. <laughs> but it has a point. Like I found in, in uh, when I came here, it, it just, it, you had, could experiment with just seeing how much you could take, you know. <laughs> and, you know, because we were coming from a, a rather kind of middle class, a background, you know, where you you don't you know men aren't don't really push their limits very much. Here it was like a real opportunity to to tempt. Like I go on fasts and you know not sleep and uh, lay down and all this just to just to just find out what it was like. And uh, Lung Po Cha encouraged that. But then after a while, you know, he, he you know you I became so. So keen on on that kind of practice that he he encouraged me to stop doing it <laughs> <laughs> because it's so willful, you know. You always you always have to push yourself, or and it, it just you know for me it just increased this uh, willfulness in me, this ditty, a sense of I've got to prove I can take this and. And, you know, so it brought up a lot of uh, ditti mana in me, and of course, I, you know, I, began, I feel I could do things that before I, I would never have attempted. But the important thing is, uh, is internal, is a uh, because it's, it's just like being able to be patient with your own mind or emotional. Feelings, rather than trying to control and suppress uh, your feelings. So, you know, over with the long term, that uh, just being, in, you know, mindfulness, uh, sati sampachanya, that, that kind of those kind of words suddenly resonate as uh, you know something is you recognize and realize the value of that rather than just will willing myself to to do a kind of extreme acts and push myself to you know kind of bear up with pain and and uh, on and on like that for me that I did learn from it but after a while you know, I had to give it up because you know it was uh, I wasn't getting to the source of the, of the ignorance, you know. It was, it, was op- it was increasing this this sense of me and mine. Where mindfulness, you know, like sati sampatanya, is where is you know it's where you can actually begin to recognize this how you create self, and and so in uh, in. Uh, Living here, like when I first, when we established one on our chart, you know, the having to take on uh, like what you're doing, taking on <laughs> responsibilities and uh, teaching and uh, giving dependence, uh, things like this. Uh, you know, you, you can see how you can do this on a personal level, like feeling of. Of I've got to do this. I've got to be a good monk and be a good head monk, or 
not let Ajahn Chah down, or all kinds of, of uh, emotions would, would come up, but then the awareness of that was rather than, than believing it, you know. So I found, you know, I could, I used the situation, the, the ups and downs of uh, taking leadership positions for just awareness of, of, you know, my own emotional reactions to things or how I see, you know, being in a prominent position. Because it both, you know, you, you can be very, uh, you know, think, you know, you're somebody important, or you can, you know, at the same time, you can start resenting it. You know, you feel burdened by, by having to be the focus for everybody's attention. Do you ever feel that? <laughs> <laughs> Resentful? <laughs> but then that's, that's where I would question, you know, that which is aware of this feeling is not that feeling. You know, so you're kind of instructing yourself, informing. Uh, you know, like you have emotions and you resent having to be in a position where everybody's always looking at you. And so you, you, uh, you know, you can either want to get a run away from it or you can kind of act a part and play a, play a role of Kuba Ajahn or whatever. Or you can actually uh, observe and then, then question that which is aware of this is is not is not resentful. The emotion itself might be resentment, or might be enjoying being, you know, considered somebody, you know, important, a teacher, and so forth. And and but that which is aware is is not doesn't is not taking sides, is not judging, but is certainly conscious and intelligent. And then you more and more you. You trust that awareness rather than the emotional messages that your your mind gives. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> like you have, like Sakya Ditti is is created through thinking. So it's, you know, like when we examine the, the thinking process, it is, it's acquired after birth and it's culturally conditioned. So you have your language and you have cultural attitudes like what's right and wrong, good and bad. And, uh, and so these, and then one grasps all kinds of the, the language and the thinking mind. And that creates always this split in this sense of you know, you're always caught in the state of doubt between right and wrong, good and bad. And uh, then you're always trying to be wanting to be right and good and then guilty about feeling wrong and bad. <laughs> uh, and that, but then awareness, you see, transcends that those, those perceptions. And uh, that's what that's what Sati Sampachanya is, is that awareness, pure awareness, pure conscious awareness. And then, then informing yourself so because, you know, on a culturally conditioned level, we're, we're programmed already through our, you know, through our con social conditioning or personality. So we have our own views, opinions, and sense of ourself or self-criticism and, uh, what, how things should be or shouldn't be, but then the awareness, you can be aware of that, and and you can have, you know, you can be aware of feeling right and wrong rather than always trying to figure out whether how right or wrong you are, or somebody else is. So this is this is the challenge I found. The kind of it's kind of almost like a quantum leap from being attached to this dualistic thinking process, to trusting in this awareness of it. And so what I did was actually, you know, investigate, listen to myself thinking, 
and then uh, being questioning like that which is aware of me think of my thoughts is not a thought you know but it's certainly consciousness I'm, and but it's not conditioned by culture you know it's, it's discerning and it's intelligent but it's not you can't claim it uh, on a personal level and if I claim say I'm I'm very wise monk then that goes into sakyaditi <laughs> But if you, if you just observe even, uh, you know, conceit or, or self-aversion or doubt or worry, then that which is aware of that is a, is a refuge. And that's the escape, that's the liberation uh, that you recognize from samsara. And it's like, because myself, when I first started, I was so, you know, I've been so involved in acquiring information and studying and, and, a, and a rabid thinker, you know, just obsessed with ideas and thoughts. And so I just tortured myself endlessly with this, this uh, obsessive thinking. And so the and I began to recognize if I could, you know, at first I just wanted to suppress thinking, but that didn't work. So I had to, instead of trying to stop it, just observe it, you know, listen to myself thinking, no matter how, whether it was intelligent or stupid or right or wrong, good or bad. And so then you're getting into this awareness, satisampachanya, where you're the observer of thought rather than the owner of the of your own thoughts and emotions. Um, yes, Dr. I have a question. Um, because you emphasize so much uh, awareness and uh, I just wanted to know because it's difficult um, yeah, we hear it so much and, uh, and even if you try it, it's uh, yeah, not not easy to follow the thoughts and all this. So I wanted to know, um, would you say there are um, other things co conducive to um, yeah establish this awareness or to help? Because, for example, when I was in a Vipassana center, uh, they also focused very much on awareness. And they said to me, like, um, eat less, sleep less, and talk less. Would you say the same or would you say there are another, another things uh, conducive to build up this awareness with the time well what, what I encourage would be to to be aware of like when you get information like eat less speak less, sleep less you know say you, somebody tells you that being aware of how it you know of, of, you should you know, if you grasp that idea that you talk too much or you shouldn't sleep so much or eat too much is still, uh, you know, you can you can be aware that uh, this is good advice actually, but but grasping it is can also be quite uh, misleading. You know, keep enforce sakya ditti all the time, like t trying to be someone who doesn't sleep anymore, doesn't lie down or eat or refuses to talk is you know still Sakya Ditti but uh, so it's more like uh, you know see those things as more like um, reflective helpful reflections but not but also see how grasping such things tends to reinforce the self view because it's so easy to you know, to feel guilty or, you know, I've seen monks feel guilty about eating food. Western monks. You know, so they, you know, they think that hunger is greed. It's kind of like personal greed where, you know, hunger is, is the nature of the body. It needs food. But, uh, you know, I've seen monks who try not to eat anything or, uh, go on fast all the time to conquer greed or hunger where you know and then then they 
then, then, then they, when they do kind of overeat, they feel guilty. But they aren't seeing what they're doing. They're, they're grasping the ideas. And that's where the directness of the practice is, is, is really looking at observing, not trying to figure out who's right or whether you need to, or you don't need to follow that, but just observe how you, how it affects you, you know, and how you, how you, it affects your sense of your self-worth or your sense of being a good monk or not good or one who talks too much or and you shouldn't or so forth you know because then we feel self-disparaging or self-critical uh, and we have different characters you know so some people are you know we all have our own karma to work through so some people are very chatty and sociable and other people very reclusive and then say which is the, which should I be should I if I'm chatty and sociable should I you know, try to stop it and be more reclusive. And if, if you're reclusive, should you force yourself to be more social? <laughs> it's all, you know, caught in the Sakyaditi problem again. So, so that see, like, like being a monk, uh, you know, recognize that you're in a kind of conventional form that's holding you. You know, you you have. Uh, this uh, vinaya and conventional, you know, on behavior and speech, and and then the monastic Thai forest tradition is like this, you know. So you you're, you're observing the the uh, convention that you're using, but not identifying with, you know, it's not to create another identity as I'm a forest monk and and uh, with uh, two donga monk and on and on like this because that's creating a self-view again but uh, you know this this particular convention is is uh, a way of living in society in the world for mindfulness so, so be you know be aware of how you create how you hold this convention you know you know how you how you identify your identity with it, or the the sense of your own being a good monk or a bad monk or pure or impure is very much a form of of you know grasping the ideal of Buddhist monasticism without really observing the grasping of of a condition. So it does you know it. I found the value of. Monasticism is that it, it does, it holds you, you know, in a way that, you know, kind of gives you boundaries for behavior. And of course, before I became a monk, I, I, I was kind of free spirit and uh, boundaries for behavior were so broad <laughs> that I didn't have any, you know, I just tended to get confused by by just uh, following my desires and and this idea of freedom and expressing yourself and doing what you like but then then in uh, going from I, I lived in Berkeley California you know it was very kind of back in the 60s a uh, place for freedom and personal expressing your individuality and then going into a very conventional type form like what Banongpa poem was kind of interesting because uh, you know I'd, I'd had such kind of narrow boundaries for behavior, but it did you know it, what what I found was that it those boundaries you know something you could you begin to observe you know how you want you know the the tendencies you have or habit tendencies or want to go beyond the boundaries or break through these limitations and that's where you. You stop, you know, you're determined to, to stay within the boundary uh, and observe the, the, it gives you something to, to uh, meet in yourself and the desire to, to uh, you know, it, I felt rebellion, rebellious a lot towards the restriction and restraint. But that I could observe, you see, this sense of, not like not wanting to be restrained, not being able to get my own way, or 
do what I want. It's like this. And so that, that's using it for awareness rather than for increasing the sense of I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't, I've got to keep these rules and my purity depends on me keeping the rules and if I break the rules then I'm impure and all that. Then it, that tended to be how I held it at first because the mind was very much conditioned in that very dualistic way of wanting to become pure and get, and fear of impurity or being wrong. <clears throat> but in the, in the mindfulness practice, then you're, you're using the, the, the sila or the vinaya, the restraint of convention, not for personal identity, but for mindfulness. Then it, then it, you appreciate it. Because you do, you know, if you really cultivate it, it, ma- it makes life very simple. You know, it simplifies everything. Because, uh, you know, monastic life really is simplification. Where, where say, my lay life was very complicated and uh, very confused. And at first, you know, when you read the Vinaya, you say, it sounds so complicated. <laughs> You know, so many do's and don'ts and precepts and whatnot. But actually, you know, it's like it's a learning, learning it, but also using it, not not to, for identity and for attachment, but for awareness and liberation. Because liberation comes in the in the, in the jitta rather than through conventions or. And there's no liberation if you're attached to self-view. You're, you're restricted and bound into that, to a limitation all the time of, of uh, self-views. I have one question. Um, when we worked in Pudinding, a Western monk came along and looked a little down because we are working so much and he told me, you know, monk should not work so much. I didn't ordain for working, you know, I worked enough in my life. But in a Chanchar's tradition, on special on polyam, he emphasizes a lot, work is a kind of practice for giving up selflessness and being useful for society and practicing during your work so you can use this time. Can you guide us to this topic? Because yeah, when, when I went, in 1967, I went to Stay at Wat Wat Pong. and uh, and they just built this sala that's no longer there, <laughs> and uh, and it wasn't finished yet. So um, it was a horrible building. So. Did you ever see it? <laughs> and so then we built the dining hall. And then we, I mean, it was constant, kind of one thing after another, and uh, built the road up to the top of Tamsang Pat. And then uh, I stayed at, then I wanted, I uh, developed an interest in staying at Tamsang Pat, and then I had to, you know, work there. There's always a sense of working and building things and developing. So, and I had the t- typical Western reaction to it. Like I came to practice not to, to be a laborer. But actually, uh, you know, I found the way Lung Pao Cha taught was, was just, you know, so getting us to see, to look at our mind rather than to just, you know, create this illusion that, that there's this division, there's work, and then there's meditation. Uh, so it, it, he kind of really integrated the whole, you know, the, the daily life, you know, the, the monastic, the bindabhata, all these, these kind of core wat things of, of uh, taking care of the alms bowl, sewing robes, uh, making tooth woods and, and stands for the alms bowl and on and on like this were, you know, were encouraged and, and then there were always necessary projects as, as Ajahn Chah became more well known we had to build a wall once you know, that 
that ugly old wall that's inside the I helped build that <laughs> that's some of my skill <laughs> it's still there I think isn't it the ugly old wall and they built a better one later out further out that they have spent afternoons building that and making cement posts. You know, we had to make our own cement posts. Rendering bricks with cement. And, but uh, we also had, you know, plenty of time for solitude. And I never felt, you know, that it was, uh, you know, that I was just, it was just a kind of endless labor camp. But I could, you know, I could make a, a kind of case for that if I wanted. But I, I could see, you know, my own ditty, you know, my own not wanting to do these things. And so there's a story, I think, in, in that book, Chitta Viveka. You know, this is quite an insight for me, where they, uh, they had this, Every, you know, I think you do it here before the one part you sweep all the paths and yeah. and clean everything. And so, you know, and in the hot season, you're, you're out there sweeping, and the dust is rising up, and 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 it's hot. And and I was too, you know, I didn't want to bother learning how to make a proper broom, so I just used usually a broom that had been discarded. So it wasn't, you know, you just it's like scratching the ground with a stick and so you know I developed this aversion to this and one day you know I was sweeping you know the day before the one part I was sweeping and I was just doing it you know because I felt obliged to and Ajahn Chah came by and and he, he saw you know I was in this very negative mental state and he said uh, what Rapon is suffering and <laughs> laughed and went on you know. <laughs> and you know then my emotional mind emotion is yes it is <laughs> but then suddenly I saw I saw that I saw what I was doing and it's like an, that's why I remember this incident because it was a powerful insight for me to see no it wasn't suffering I was creating suffering you know, what's sweeping the ground isn't suffering but if I don't want to do it you know and I resent it then I'm then that's that's the suffering I'm creating you know so actually sweeping the the leaves is not or you know if the when I began to reflect more and see what what suffering really is rather than just blaming the what seems obvious and this is why why you, you know you start examining this this noble truth so what is a suffering you know is working suffering or is my not wanting to work suffering or you know whatever it is you can you can kind of question yourself and explore investigate that and then I you know I realized that actually what my poem was uh, you know pretty good place you know it was it was, you know, they had good teacher, good monks, uh, had enough food, shelter, robes. The things that you needed were, uh, you know, very available. And uh, and then I began to just see how, you know, then then my critical mind could always figure out ways of how I'd like it to be or didn't like what I didn't like about it. But then that's my what I create out of my own self views preferences and likes and dislikes. So it's it, kind of like those moments leave a strong impression in your consciousness because that happened many, many years ago before Nana Cha and before Western months started arriving. And I've always remembered that because it was like something changed in me at that moment. I saw the the uh, origin of suffering in my mind rather than believing that I'm suffering because I have to work too much here yeah. <laughs> but uh, also you know there's 
you also watch yourself like in, in views and opinion like you shouldn't work you should just practice or you have to work and practice you know these, these both true but not right right but not true and so it's, it's like when, once you think something and grasp it it becomes a ditty a kind of ditty in your mind and then it, even though it might be right in its own context it's not necessarily true as a, as a, as a reality and so it, it, you begin to to you know in, in monastic life I found there's so much ditty in monks you know views about what good practice is and how you should do it and uh, what's a right and what's wrong and so forth that, that uh, you know I found it very confusing uh, in, in terms of trying to figure out you know what to do or what not to do but in terms of awareness then I began to see that, that uh, grasping views and opinions of any sort is, uh, is the cause of suffering so in, in uh, my insight was then like when I'm living here then I you know I'm aware of the people the time the place the the uh, way they practice and so I adapt myself to you know try to live within that rather than assert my will here you, you know I'm not going to do this because I don't agree with you you know I just adapt to the different you know c conventions or ways of practice that, that various monasteries favor rather than judging it you know or believing my own uh, opinions about it. <clears throat> then I can ask a second question. So the one side is doing things together, working together, have meetings, but on the other side the Buddha praised a lot solitude. So uh, could you also speak a little about uh, solitude? Is this really necessary? How sh much should we have or is this a danger or should we do it? Well, I think in, in, in this particular tradition, you know, the Thai... There's a light coming from there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's not aliens. But this is like... The attractiveness of the Thai force tradition to many of us is... Uh, is the solitude part of it, you know, like the having your own kuti, and uh, where solitude, you know, gaya viveka is, is uh, you know, part of the lifestyle, you know, solitude, physical solitude, and then, uh, because there's a monastery in England, uh, that um, they, they practice a kind of Zen, Japanese Zen style and they have um, they have um, up in Northumberland and they and they just all live together all the time you know sleep in you know they s sleep side by side almost in, in very you know the, so everything if you get a place all your own a private room that's, that's you have to have about 10 years before they allow that and I thought what a horrible way to live yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't join that group <laughs> but they're very good actually you know they're very impressive uh, monks that they produce but um, it's you know then I be, you know then I recognize that what I really what's so attractive to me to this particular tradition was the fact that it it uh, had your own cootie <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then when we you know so that that is like you, and Gaya Viveka is uh, encouraged so you know the Tudonga 
going off walking to Dong and living in the forest or in caves. This is part of a lifestyle of this tradition. But also, in, like Ajahn Chah, say, contrasting to the Tamayut style, tended to more, more create the sense of Sangha, uh, living together. And, and that's where, uh, you know, I found very helpful to me because it was going against what I really wanted. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to live in a monastery with a lot of monks having to work with them or live with them. I liked the idea of going off alone and living in solitude. But the, but I did see, you know, I observed my own view about it. So when, when I went to live in England, then, and we, uh, established Chitter's Monastery. It was the first monastery in Sussex. You know, I named it Jitter Viveka because I thought, I'm never going to get any Gaya Viveka here. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm the center of this whole thing. So, and then the Jitter Viveka thing became very apparent. You know, finding solid, inner solitudes. So that whole sense of Jitter Viveka came very strong in England. And uh, then Ubati Viveka is the third one. It's freedom. <laughs> but uh, this is this way of, you know, of using words to more or less contemplate your own, you know, the situation you're in. Because if you're in a community uh, and then you just want to be alone, well then the suffering is wanting to be alone, not wanting to be here. And so you, 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 that's why, you know, you can use the situation for observing, you know, desire, wanting something you don't have, or not wanting what you have to be like the way it is. So like when Wat Pa Po, uh, I, uh, after those insights, then I just decided to just accept whatever the way it is, you know, rather than I was trying to to follow my own dissatisfaction or feelings of wanting to if you know the things wanting to get away from a place or I try to observe that more than grasp those feelings. So there's a sense of Rebecca uh, or solitude or is uh, you know stupid recognize that the real Viveka is here. And then, then, then this, this, you begin to, to get in touch with this stillness, you know, this, this sense of, of uh, stillness that is everywhere and is not created out of desire or ignorance. And uh, you know, so it doesn't, then after one, it doesn't matter. I don't really care where I am anymore because it, it's not, the important issue. You know, so I do appreciate the Thai force tradition because I get to live in very nice places, you know, and I don't have to live in London or Bangkok for very long. I can look in now and then and but you know, the style of life the the is one where you have this forest this sense of forest tradition to be like in in the Baigiri and and that you have the Kutis and Chitters and and where you know you're you're trying to in, create that possibility in in uh, in the West, but it's not it's not you know it still doesn't it isn't a necessity. It's not like you have to have that, but it it is part of the kind of lifestyle. So like sitting and walking, meditation and formal practices. After a while you don't, you don't feel that necessary anymore. You know, like you need, you, you lose this sense of, I've got to meditate, got to get this, got to spend hours, uh, you know, in samadhi and walk so many hours. And after a while you begin to see that you don't need to do that. and. 
it's not necessary but and how compulsive so much of my early practice was you know based on on this kind of compulsiveness of feeling there's something I've got to get I've got to get something I don't have or I've got to get rid of these uh, you know the, the feelings that I think I shouldn't have and just observing in that in that 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 Danha pattern, you know, bawa gama dana bawa dana vipa dana, the grasping of it. But still, monastic life is sitting still and walking, meditating. What else is there to do? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it comes much more just as part of a lifestyle rather than a sense of compulsion and I've got to get this and get rid of that. That whole Sakyaditi sense falls away. So your life is no longer motivated by Sakyaditi or feelings like uh, uh, obsessive compulsive habits and views that I, you know, that were very much, you know, I had in the, in the, in the first years of monastic life, very strong feeling of having to get something, and get rid of something 